it's the 1960s. The Big Bang is a hypothesis, an idea. A lot of astronomers don't take it that seriously. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a math, it's some cool stuff, it's consistent with the facts, but can we ever test it? Can we ever really seriously test it one way or another? Probably not. George Gamow and then other people building on this have made some calculations that if the Big Bang theory is correct, then the whole sky should be filled with microwaves at a temperature of, uh, they eventually refined down somewhere around a few degrees Kelvin. So, could we ever measure that? Could we detect that? Could we see that? Could we observe this? Eh, the equations aren't clue, clear about how bright it would be. It would probably be too faint to ever detect it. 1965. Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. Penzias and Wilson. They are in New Jersey at Bell Labs. Bell Labs in New Jersey. They are experimenting with new ways of sending signals back and forth. Remember, this is the early days of the space age, you know, people are satellites and moon rockets and all this sort of thing going on there. And so they're experimenting with new types of communication. They have this microwave antenna, and they're looking at uh, trying to send signals back and forth. Sending microwave signals. You know, there's this kind of big metal horn-shaped antenna. They're trying to send signals back and forth, and they keep getting this horrible interference, this nasty, awful, ridiculous interference, you know, so they go through, they tear out all the electronics, which back in those days is radio tubes, and they put new ones in, and they can't get it to work. They scrape out the pigeon droppings. They try to do everything, and they can't figure out why there's this horrible noise, this 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 noise filling up their, their antenna so they can't get their signals across until finally one of them goes up on the roof and realizes the antenna's pointing slightly up at the sky, and he takes the, 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 this horn-shaped thing antenna and points it down at the earth, and the noise goes away. The noise is gone. It's a real thing. It's not bad equipment. It's not bad radio tubes. It's a real thing. They're really, and they find that wherever they point this in the sky, these microwaves are there. They discover this, this hiss, this, this glow of microwaves filling the whole entire sky everywhere they point it. The whole thing about how they then connect up with the astronomers and realize that George Gamow and the Big Bang Theory and all this sort of thing is kind of a cool thing. It's one of these uh, stories of history. Are they sitting, guys sitting next on a plane, going to this conference, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing this. You're Anyway, it's a long story. There's books been written about that. A great story. But in the end, they realize, they connect to these guys over at Princeton who were actually thinking about building a microwave antenna and seeing if they could find the glow of the Big Bang filling the whole sky until then they realized that, nope, these guys found it. They saw, they, they're, they're trying to send microwaves that they discover the whole sky is glowing with microwaves and they are at a temperature of just about three degrees Kelvin. They found it. They discovered it. And as a result of this, Penzias and Wilson won the Nobel Prize in, in physics for this great discovery and that's the point. That's the point when the Big Bang goes from being a hypothesis, you know, an idea, an interesting idea maybe, uh, and it becomes a real theory. Now we have evidence behind it. It is Remember, you can't go back in time and see the Big Bang take place. What you can do is you can take the Big Bang equations and say, well, if these equations are true, what's something out there that I could observe and test? The Big Bang equations make a very specific, testable prediction. The whole sky should be filled with these microwaves. Better than that, they predict a specific number, a particular number. In the modern version of the Big Bang theory, good grief, now we can predict the number to, to, to a dozen different digits. It's a two temperature of 2.725 kelvins, and the whole sky is filled with this glow of 2.725 kelvins. That's the heart and soul of science. When I have a theory, a set of equations, which predict a specific number, and then I go out with my, in this case, microwave, microwave antenna and measure that number and the numbers work. The number that comes out of my theory is the same as the number I measure with my apparatus. Then we take this idea seriously. Even though I can't see what happened 14 billion years ago, the equations that tell me what happened from this idea of what might have happened 14 billion years ago tell me something here and I can test and it's right. It's true. It's verifiable. Is that the end? Not even close. Okay, so this is good. This is interesting. Now people start taking this Big Bang idea really, really seriously. Now people are interested. This could be real science. Now we can actually measure things. Do we, is this enough? No, we need more evidence. How about more evidence? Let's think about this. The next step, so, the, the, this, so this is called, so evidence that supports 
The Big Bang Theory. Number one, the expansion of the universe. That's kind of what kicked this whole thing off. The expansion of the universe. Number two, the cosmic microwave background radiation discovered by Penzias and Wilson in 1965. The cosmic microwave background radiation. Big, huge piece of evidence. Nobody has any other theory that explains why the whole sky is filled with this glow at a temperature of 3 degrees Kelvin other than, than that. I mean, this, this is huge. Nobody else has any other way to explain that. And then, the theory that we call Big Bang, Bang Nucleo Synthesis. And now i got to tell you what that means. What does Big Bang Nucleosynthesis mean? It means that our universe is filled with, what's it, about 70% hydrogen, about 20, 25, 28% helium, and then maybe about 2% the other elements. Why? We've mentioned this before, you know, the iron that makes my blood red, the calcium in my bones, the oxygen in my lungs, the carbon that holds my DNA together, these elements didn't, weren't around from the beginning. These were created by stars. Why not? Why did the Big Bang make certain atoms and not others? Here's how it goes. From the Big Bang equations, we can calculate what was the temperature and density of the universe from the point of beginning. Initially, the universe was really, really hot everywhere. Every point in the whole universe was hotter than the core of a star. So that means you could do nuclear reactions in the whole universe everywhere, the same way today we do them in the cores of stars. But you could only do that for a while. You know, the universe is expanding, and then we can calculate, well, how long if the Big Bang equations are right, how long was the universe hot enough to do nuclear fusion reactions and make, you know, different types of atom, atomic nuclei? And we go to the Big Bang equations and we can calculate the answer? Three minutes. The Big Bang equations say the universe was hot and dense enough to do nuclear fusion reactions to create different atomic nuclei, that kind of stuff, for only three minutes. So there's the instant of beginning, and for three minutes you can do stuff, and then it gets cool enough, there's not enough energy around, you're no longer as hot as the core of a star, so now then, you know, the atoms are now locked into place. Uh, fusion, nuclear reactions in general. Nuclear reactions could occur everywhere for three minutes. And then the universe is cool enough, and then 100,000, 300,000 years after that, then electrons get stuck to atoms, and then, you know, rather than just having it be ionized, the electron's free. But no, after a few hundred thousand years, electrons get stuck to atoms. Now the universe becomes transparent. The microwave glow, you know, the glow fills the sky. The ex universe goes on expanding for 14 billion years. Stars form, galaxies form, yada, yada, yada. Here I am. I'm the result of all this. Okay, great. Here's the key idea. The Big Bang equations say that nuclear reactions could occur everywhere for three minutes. Well, what are they going to make? We have equations for nuclear fusions. You know, the guys down in Los Alamos, the bomb people, they know all about nuclear reactions. Well, so we astronomers can use that. We can then take the temperature and density, you know, as it starts out really hot and really dense, and then these decrease for three minutes. We can take the Big Bang temperature and density stuff, put them together with nuclear fusion stuff, and say, well, what do you get? If the Big Bang equations are right, and we know the nuclear fusion equations are right, and bombs explode, and so then we can say, well, what would be the result of this? What would you get? What would you get from three minutes of fusion? Here's what you would get. Basically, 75% of the universe would be hydrogen. Hydrogen. 25% of the universe would be helium. You would then get a tiny trace of deuterium, uh, heavy hydrogen, a little bit of lithium, a little bit of beryllium, just these teeny tiny little traces of a couple of other life traces. Traces of lithium and beryllium, certain specific types of atoms of those, and then nothing else. 
Why? Because three minutes isn't that long. If you had more time to work, maybe we could do other stuff, you know, based on them. But no, if the Big Bang equations are right, you're going to fill the universe with 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. You'll have time to get these teeny little traces of lithium and beryllium and nothing else. If the Big Bang equations are right, then after those first three minutes, there should be no carbon nuclei, no iron, no oxygen, no nitrogen, no lead, no fluorine, no uranium, none of these other elements. The whole universe should be filled with exactly this stuff. Now, of course, today we see, you know, there is carbon out there, there is nitrogen, there is oxygen. Well, we think those were made inside stars. So I want to test this out. So this is a specific testable prediction that this is what was filling the whole universe before the first stars formed. And we can find gas, which has been nowhere, anywhere near a star. You know, today you look around gas in our universe, or in our, our galaxy, and, well, the, seven, the hydrogen has actually decreased since stars have kind of burned up a lot of this. This is down to around 70%. Helium has increased because, you know, stars make helium. There are all these other elements, all this sort of thing. No, if I want to test this prediction, the specific mathematical testable prediction of the Big Bang Theory, I want to, I want to look at gas, which has never been anywhere near a star. And the whole history of the universe has never been anywhere near a star. Unfortunately, there's a lot of that gas out in the universe. We call these intergalactic clouds. Big clouds of gas, which are between galaxies and are too low density that they never formed stars. And they've never been within a million light years of a star anywhere. They're just out there. The Big Bang happened to them and then that's the only event in their history until now. We can do this. Using absorption line spectrum, spectrum, we can measure the exact chemical composition of intergalactic clouds. Big clouds of gas floating in between galaxies that have never been anywhere near a supernova explosion, you know, that pollutes our universe with carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. No, no, no. These have been pristine, untouched by anything except for the Big Bang. And you know what? When we measure the chemical composition of every intergalactic cloud in the entire universe, and we've discovered thousands of intergalactic clouds, millions, I don't know, lots of them, every single one of them has precisely and exactly the same chemical composition. That's an observation. 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 Something that can be measured and double-checked. Every intergalactic cloud galactic cloud has the same chemical composition. They're all 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, little tiny traces of lithium and beryllium, and no iron, no carbon, no nitrogen, no oxygen, nothing else. Every single intergalactic cloud has precisely and exactly the same chemical composition, and it's exactly the number. The numbers work. It's precisely and exactly the same numbers that we get out of the Big Bang equations. When you take the Big Bang equations and the nuclear fusion equations, you put them together, you do that three minutes of calculations, you get this stuff and nothing else, and that's exactly what we measure from intergalactic clouds. That's how I know what took place 14 billion years ago. That's not a coincidence. There's no way that this just bluntly, you know, this happened to get onto the truth. Forget about it. Not a chance. This is how I know what took place billions of years before any human being was around to observe it. This is the heart and soul of science. This is what science is. This is how science works. We observe the universe, we look for patterns, we propose this crazy, weird, outlandish theory that the universe had this moment of beginning, this moment of creation, and then you know, we have equations for this, and then we look at those equations and say, okay, I can't see what happened 14 billion years ago. I can see what's happening now. What do these equations predict? These equations predict the cosmic microwave background equation, background radiation, and it's there at the right temperature, and they predict the exact chemical composition of these intergalactic clouds, and it matches up perfectly. That's how we know the Big Bang was a real event and our universe really did get started with the Big Bang.